الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وإقرار به توحيدا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما مزيدا أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is our third week والحمد لله and this is con- consist of our fifth class or fifth, fifth session and this is dealing with the meaning of attitude we're on our third acronym which is attitude but before beginning inshallah we'd like to mention two tremendous statements that are very um, important and one of those statements you might have heard us talk about before but inshallah ta'ala we're going to reiterate it here because of the weight of the statement in retrospect to what we go through in our lives and it's very beneficial. It was stated by one of the Imams of the past, who's Ibn as Samak, Rahimahullah, who said that Dunya Kulluha Qalilu. He said that about the dunya, which is the life of this world that we currently live in, he said that the time that's allotted for each of us in this dunya is short and it is brief. And I think sometimes we don't think about the um, the shortness or the relativity to ourselves about short and what does it mean by short that our time period or our lifespan is really short uh, when it comes to dealing with the dunya as opposed to the hereafter because there is everlasting in the hereafter he continued his statement by saying Wala the baqiya minha qalilun and that which remains from it that which resides and remains from the dunya itself is also short. And then he says, min al-baqi And whatever that is decreed for you, or whatever is for you within from your portion of the dunya is also short. Walam yuqi min qalilika illa qalil. He said, and there's nothing that remains from the short of time that you have except that that is short as well and I think that this statement it touched me is very profound it's very deep and we're not going to elaborate on too much of it because it would take too much of this class and I don't have the time for for that but just think of those words and think of the statement of Allah when he mentions over and over throughout the Quran fi surah to kaf fi surah to mu'minun and many different surahs in the Quran Allah Jalla talks about this concept of time where he says that he will ask, how long have you tarry? How long have you stay here? And he would say a day or perhaps a day. And that's how relative and that's how short our time here are on this earth. And if that's really the case, and if we really reflect on that and we really understand that, then everything else will fall in play. Everything else will fall in line. And we will really be those people who are taking our time seriously and taking what we're doing seriously. So that's how important it is to understand that statement, that everything is brief. There is another statement I wanted to bring to as an introduction to this talk today. And this statement, by the permission of Allah, it was said that, مَنْ يَشْعُرُوا بِالْإِكْتِعَابِ وَالْقُرْآنُ مَوْجُودٌ And I want you to really pay attention to this statement. This is a statement that's going to be said is in no way belittling the um, state or the condition or the importance of depression or anxiety or any such disorders within the mental health realm. This is not belittling that at all. But the statement, if you listen to it in this context, you will really understand how important and profound the statement is it says, من يشعر بالاكتئاب 
wal Quran mawjudun. Whoever suffers from depression, okay, because al iktiab is actually depression. Whoever suffers from depression, and there's many types of depression. And here, whoever suffers from depression, and the many different types of depression, while the Quran is in reach. In other words, mawjud actually means literally mean presence. But here, what's understood is while the Quran is in reach, while the Quran is writing your present, as Allah he says in the Quran, and pay attention to this when Allah expelled our parents from the paradise, which was Adam wal Hawa. Allah Jalla He says, minha jami'an. All of you leave, go down, get from here, meaning from the paradise, go down to the earth collectively. Allah said, فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدَى فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And this is very important to this statement that we're talking about as an introduction for today's talk. And that is, Allah Azza wa Jalla said, after sending our parents down to the earth, something take place. He says, if it comes to you, if it reaches you, Hidayah, guidance, and we know that this Hidayah comes in the form of revelation, prophets, etc., etc. And Adam, alayhi salam, our father, was the first prophet. If this guidance comes from you, meaning from me to you, if it reaches you from me, this guidance, whosoever follow it, whosoever follows this guidance that comes from me, which I'm going to send to you in the earth as a beacon, as a light, as a salvation, as a protection, as a guide, to navigate through life on earth. This is what I'm trying to get you to understand this verse is saying. You cannot reside on earth. You cannot navigate through earth. You cannot deal with life on earth without this guidance. Right? You can't deal with life on earth without this guidance. Henceforth the rest of the verse. So whosoever of you follow this guidance, mean accept it, follow it, listen to it, be guided by it, believe in it, etc. Now he mentioned two emotions that we as humans here on earth will experience with no doubt, no question. He mentioned that they will not have any khawfun. We talked about this before, khawfun. And we also talked about um, uh, hazan and the different types of hazan and what does it mean. But he talks about these emotions that we experience far as fear, far as grief, far as depression, far as anxiety. And that one is in connection to the past and one is in connection to the future. If it's connected to the past, then something can happen from that which is called sadness, um, which can cause despair, which can cause depression, and which can cause, um, which, which is called sadness, despair, depression, right, and grief. And then that which happens in the future that didn't take place, that you don't have no control over, is known as what we call anxiety. All right? So Allah Azza wa Jal, He mentioned, فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ He's saying that if they follow this guidance, they're not going to be boggled down with these emotions. They're not going to allow these emotions to sink them down, as they say, the sunken place, right? They're not going to allow these emotions to take them to that sunken place. Because in paradise, these emotions are going to be removed. But Allah, after expelling our parents from the paradise, because they didn't have these emotions in the paradise, notice now, these emotions are associated to earth. I hope you made that connection. None of these emotions are... Are, are present in the actual paradise, okay? These emotions that we have, that we suffer, and that we feel is a part of life on earth. You understand? It's a part of life on earth. So Allah Azza says, knowing that you're going to, to experience these emotions, because Adam and Eve didn't have these emotions when they was in the paradise. But until Allah sent them down, <laughs> He sent them down, go down collectively from here, from the, from the heavens, from the paradise. Allah sent them down, then you will be, if you follow these guidance, then 
you will be what? فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ There will be no fear nor grief upon them. They will not experience or be boggled down by these emotions. They will come across them, but they will not be boggled down and drowned into the sunken place. And that's what this statement is telling you. So let's go back to the beginning of the statement as the introduction to this talk. مَنْ يَشْعُرُ بِالْإِكْتِعَابِ وَالْقُرْآنُ مَوْجُودٌ Whoever suffers from depression, you understand? While the Qur'an is in his reach, this Hidayah we were just talking about, whoever suffers from it, while the Qur'an is there, كَمَنْ يَشْعُرُ بِالْأَطُشِ وَالْمَاءُ مَوْجُودٌ This individual resembles or is like the one who is thirsty. The one who is thirsty while water is in his reach. He can quench his thirst. He or she can quench their thirst, but the problem is if they remain in that state of being thirsty and do not take the means for whereby they can quench that thirst, then they are like the one, then they are the ones who are being deprived. And that's what it's saying in the beginning half. You are suffering depression. You are suffering these human emotions, which I'm going to now give us the understanding they call earthly emotions. You are suffering emotions that you're going to have here on earth. They don't exist in the life after. These emotions only here. So you're suffering these emotions while you have the Quran. Whoever suffered depression while the Quran is in reach, it's like the one who is thirsty while water is in reach. Meaning that they don't take on the means whereby that it can remove those things. That statement is in line with that verse. You see how Allah is telling you? I sent you down to earth. You're going to experience emotions that you didn't experience when you was in paradise. But now I gave you a guidance. Okay? If you take that guidance, it's going to remove these human emotions so that you don't be boggled down. That's the point. Now, this third acronym, which is the acronym, the word grateful, is which we base this course off by the permission of Allah to help us cope with these earthly emotions that we all might experience. Um, some might suffer more than others. Some brush up with it. It's dealing with the attitude. This A stands for attitude, which we know in Arabic, which we know in Arabic to be husnul dhan. Husnul dhan, okay? Husnul dhan is important, brothers and sisters, and that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about how husnul dhan plays an important role in us combating or even coping with these earthly emotions. And that is attitude, okay? And we're going to use the statement of Ibn Qayyim, as, as we said, this whole course is based off the works of Ibn Qayyim and Jaziyyah. Um, Rahmatullah ta'ala alayhi, may Allah make his grace spacious at me. Okay, our thoughts have a powerful ability to determine our feelings and emotions, okay? What we think, our perception, the way we feel about things, okay? Positive, negative, it all affects our state and our condition. I want us to stop here and really reflect what I'm saying. What you think affects your condition. So if you're in a funk, if you're in a rut, or you're feeling down, then you need to begin to filter and go back into your thought process. Yes, there are things in experience in life that we will come across that will affect us one way or the other. And there are things that we must have in order for us to not allow that effect to take us in a direction that we do not want to go and that we may not can recover from as opposed to taking us in the direction that we need. And that is attitude. That is perception. You're perceived. What do you perceive? It's about having personal dhan. Having this good thought, maintaining this, maintaining this good thought, as you should see in this talk, how deep this is. So it has the ability to determine our feelings, what we feel, and our emotional state. And it ultimately 
Because our emotions and our feelings pretty much are the same, which do what? It affects how we behave. Our actions are results of our feelings and emotions, which are results of our thoughts. If our attitude is poor, poor, if our attitude is not proper and it is not good and it is bad attitude and it's a bad perception, which we mean it is a pessimism versus optimism, which the we're going to see that the Prophet Sallallahu encouraged within the deen. It's important to understand this because the way that we view things and see things and perceive things, it's going to determine how we are going to behave when certain things happen that might be in our control and may not be in our control. All right. So, Islam teaches us the direct act of what we call tafakkur. We dealt with we dealt with that. Alhamdulillah, that was our second coping mechanism, which was reflection or deep thought towards the signs of Allah Azza wa Jal, the names and attributes of Allah. I don't think many of us really take time to think on that, about Allah names and attributes. It's important to really study that because that's one of the ways, it's actually one of the ways that you get to know Allah. So you, you should not overlook that, that's important. And interestingly enough, right? When it comes to Muslims and Islam, Interestingly enough, most of the sects that went astray really went astray in this area here, dealing with the law names and attributes. And the reason why I'm saying interestingly enough is because I'm trying to tell you that it deals with how we, how we, how we understand Allah. How we perceive and view Allah deals with his names and his attributes. So it's important to us to understand it. His blessings and his wonders to hope in the hereafter and to optimism. Attitude Good attitude always have a connect or co or a, a direct correlation or connection with optimism, perception and optimism. Okay, by con by controlling the way our thought process, controlling our thought process in a positive manner, we can increase the effectiveness of our prayers and worship as well as relieve ourselves from the anger, depression. And anxieties that the worldly thoughts induce. Do you understand that? In other words, if we have optimism, as we're going to learn, and if we have good perception and good thoughts in the way that we're supposed to, it will help us control our anger, which is another earthly emotion, which stay tuned throughout this week before the next class. We will have a pop-up video explaining how to control one anger what is anger, how to understand anger, and how to combat it. Also, stay tuned. We're going to have a pop-up video before this week and we close out, which will be another video explaining good character because it falls in line if you read your course outline with this actual course here that we're dealing with this coping mechanism. We cover good character um, and things like that. So we're going to cover those two areas in a separate video, not in just the main video that we have now. Um, also... As he continues, he says, contrary to proper belief, we have control over which thoughts we choose to follow. Okay? This is where your limited will comes in play. So you say that Allah gave us free will, right? So what does it mean? And we always said this. If you pay attention to what we always say, you have control over only one thing, and that is your choice. Okay? The way you choose, that's what your limited will is. Everything else is not in your hands. And a lot of us don't make that connection. Everything else is not in your hands. It's your choice. You're going to have two paths. Allah talks about that in the Quran. وَنَجْعَلَهُ najdain. وَنَجْعَلَهُ najdain. And we made for him two paths. You're going to have a path that leads to the right. And you're going to have a path that leads to the left. Okay, the right path is going to be the right path. The straightforward path. The path that is not the right is going to be the path that's going to be incorrect. You have the ability... And your will is that you have your control over your choice selection. Which path you choose is going to be the responsibility of you. Do you understand that? That's where your control stops. It doesn't go or exceed further than that. That's where it stops at. So, we may not have a choice over which particular thought occurs initially in our minds at a given time. 
but we do have a choice to ignore it or pursue it. And this is something that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us in an authenticated hadith that comes in, uh, even now we collect this in the 40 hadith, and it's the 39th uh, hadith, where he mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Allah Jalla wa Ala has forgiving, all of my servants are forgiven. Okay? For the thoughts that they have, as long as they don't do two things, state them or act on them. Whatever they were forced to do, they are forgiven for that because they were coerced. And whatever thoughts that they have, they will not be taken into account. Allah Jalla wa'ala has a verse in Surah Baqarah, which is the 283rd verse, um, 80, the 83rd verse, if I'm correct that the companions were really disturbed when they heard the verse, and Allah Jalla wa'ala sent down the next verse abrogating that. Well, Allah Jalla wa'ala tells them, يُحَاسِبُكُمُ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنفُسُكُمْ That Allah will bring you account for what you have with inside you. In other words, the thoughts that you think that are bad thoughts, Allah will hold you accountable for that. So when the companions heard that, they was actually kind of disturbed because they were saying that these thoughts, sometimes we cannot be in control of what might filters into our minds. And if Allah was to bring us to account for those type of negative thoughts, where would we be at? We'd probably all be destroyed, right? So, Allah Azza wa Jal, He made a concession by saying that Allah yakfiru li man yasha'u wa yu'addibu man yasha'u. Allah forgives whomsoever He wills, and He punishes whomsoever He wills. And He alleviated us the responsibility of being charged with what we think. And imagine all the negative thoughts that go through our mind throughout the day. Imagine if someone wronged us. Imagine if someone lied to us. Imagine if someone have caused us some type of physical harm. Imagine if we are upset and someone caused us to be angry. Imagine if we are annoyed and someone have annoyed us or caused any type of annoyance. Annoyance. Imagine how we will behave and what thoughts that cross our mind. Imagine roll rage, which is very real for those who drive. Right? Imagine driving and someone cut you off or someone makes a wrong turn or someone doesn't signal. Imagine how you feel, the rush, the blood that rushes up and the anger that you get. Imagine what comes out your mouth sometimes. Because next time we be stating it. You effing, you know, we go crazy. For, feel, for hijab, for niqab, you know, for toe, kufi on, doesn't matter. No matter whoever you are, sometimes you can't control yourself. You go in reality, here, you can't control yourself. But sometimes you get to the point, you call someone, you, you know what I mean? You, you just start saying all of these explicitities, meaning that you start using profanity and cursing and stuff like that. But all of that happens, imagine all of that. Imagine Allah now bringing you account for those thoughts that emanates from within inside you. Don't you see the rahmah of Allah? Allah is merciful that He doesn't hold you account for those negative thoughts. Okay? So that's important for us to understand. That's what this is saying. Those thoughts that evade our minds, that we cannot have no control over sometimes, we do not, we have the choice and the control start with either to ignore them or to pursue them. Our voluntary thoughts are nothing more than inward statements. Hence the rule is that we should only engage good thoughts or keep our minds silent. Okay, we should only keep what we call good thoughts. It's important that you train and control and filter your mind to keep good thoughts. A hadith where the Prophet وسلم, said from Abu Hurairah The Prophet وسلم, said in this hadith collected by Bukhari uh, on the authority of Abu Hurairah he said whoever believes in Allah on the last day he connected here Iman. Whoever believes in Allah on the last day then he made a command let him speak good or remain silent. In other words, this hadith is showing you, it's a command, and it's also a hadith that deals with good character, and you might hear it in our pop-up video when we talk about good character. But this hadith shows us how to really control our choice. This teaches you that. Because if it's a negative thought, and if it's a negative expression, you don't have to say it. If you believe in Allah and you believe in the last day, why did, why did he mention both of these at the same? Inshallah ta'ala, if you read the different explanations of the ulama, they're going to explain to you. Believing in Allah, Iman. Believing in the last day, 
Iman. But why did he mention out these two things? Because one, your taqwa of Allah is, wajal, is making you aware that Allah is aware, okay? And that you are in, in, in front of Allah. We move our lives daily that we don't think that we are in front of Allah. Your whole life you're in front of Allah. Bani day Rabbi. I don't think you understand that. We really don't. And this is why people say, I want to be a muhsin. I want to you know, get to this level of being a muhsin. No, being a muhsin is meaning that you are, you're behaving as if Allah see you. I mean, you're behaving as if you see Allah. And if you cannot achieve that state, which is the highest of the state, and then the next thing is that Allah sees you. So you're moving and your actions is going to be that you're in front of Allah. You're not, Allah is not, you're not hidden from Allah. There's nowhere on earth you can ever be alone. There's no such thing of being alone. I mean, we have this concept that, yeah, we really are alone. No, you're really not. You might be alone from other humans, but you're not alone from Allah. There's never a moment that you can ever be alone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always watching. But the problem is our level of faith is not having us realize the intensity of that watch. So we might not be strong enough to fight our, or repel our urges of doing things wrong, even in front of his eyes. So here, Allah, here the Prophet has given us something beautiful here. He's connecting the fact that Allah is all aware, which is one of his attributes in his name, al Khabir, that Allah is all aware. And this type of attribute is meaning that he's aware of the most hidden things. Things that you think Allah SWT is more aware of those things. Then he connected Yom Akira. And the reason why he connected Yom Akira is to tell us that what? Accountability. You're not getting away. Okay? Which distilled the notion that, you know, when you're a child, and you know how sometimes some religious families or parents, they might say to you, don't lie, God is going to send you to hell. Don't do that. This is going to happen, right? And then when you start realizing you're a little bit older, Nothing happened, right? And you're just still doing it and nothing happened. But what this shows us in this hadith is that Allah is a is patient, but it is going to happen. You will be brought account. Whoever believe in Allah in the last day, if you understand this, then you're going to either speak good or remain silent. Either speak good or remain silent. And that's important for us to understand. Thus, when we find ourselves caught up in a bad line of thinking, we need to do what? Immediately replace these negative thoughts with positive inward statements to cancel their effects. Because those negative thoughts, they don't lay dormant. I see them sometimes we think that that's because you have a bad thought, it doesn't affect you. Wrong. Those negative thoughts, if you dwell on them and you do not immediately flush them out, they're going to affect you. They leave a residue which actually sparks you to act or say or to behave in an unruly manner that will only harm you, not the next person. You understand? So we have to be careful of that. Attitude is important, brothers and sisters, and it helps us combat these earthly emotions that we are going to experience. Depression is real. Filling down and not always filling up is real. Not understanding why you can't eat. This is how deep depression can actually become so inactive that you're no longer a part of a routine. That you're so caught up in the abyss that the sadness or the feeling of it is just weighing you down like bricks. It's like somebody just placing all of this weight on you and you cannot look up. And that is important that you must it does pessimism is a part of that negative thoughts that's what comes from it it's important it's important that you must constantly guard your mind what you put in it can harm you so you must constantly guard your mind here it is he says positive thoughts are are those that produce good feelings you want to feel good? Think good. So simple, right? You want to feel good? Think good. So simple. This is all optimism, by the way. Just like negative thoughts cause pessimism, same thing as good thoughts cause what we call optimism. Okay? Peace of mind. You hear a lot of people talk about that. I want to be in a relationship. I want peace of mind. I want to deal with somebody. I want peace of mind. What is the concept of peace of mind? So if you really don't understand peace of mind, peace of mind is not an elated feeling. It's not that dopamine that you have 
you know, you know, some people get high. They, they, a lot of people who are depressed, they tend to actually abuse substance abuse as an escape route. So because they get caught up on the feeling itself, they get sucked in and thinking that the problem actually went somewhere because they don't have to face it at that moment. But the problem never went nowhere. And in terms of that, it actually caused them to become worse. And it caused them to have physical problems as well as it caused them to have spiritual problems. And it keeps and it destructs them. So that's not to talk about substance abuse here. We're going to do a pop-up video talking about substance abuse, but that's not this video now. So I want you to understand something important. What is the concept of peace of mind? Okay? Now, contentment is true. That can be a result of a combination of things. Peace of mind is one of the things that comes from contentment. But peace of mind is not contentment. Peace of mind is one of those things that comes from contentment. But what is peace of mind? Peace of mind is a mind that is free from being affected by pessimism, which is negative way of thinking. Do you understand? If you can free your mind from negative thoughts, no matter which avenue it comes, okay? If you can free your mind of that, you have achieved a peace of mind. Just having good thoughts brings about that state because good thoughts produce good feelings, okay? Good emotions, which produce positive behaviors. So if that's the case, all you have to do is guard your mind to be able to give it a peace of mind from those negative thoughts that you might have. So you don't want to have those type of way of thinking. It's important to understand that. He said, these are thoughts about the world. Now pay attention to what he's getting ready to say. He says, gratitude, tranquility, contentment, and other positive emotional states that all comes from the way of thinking. Allah <laughs> Akbar. Ain't this beautiful? The creator didn't leave nothing. The way you think creates your state. <laughs> I'm depressed today. Okay, what was you thinking about? What did you allow to invade? What remedies did you use to actually ward it off? When those insinuations came in and they came pouring in. But what did you do to compact it, to deflect it, to move yourself away from it? Do not get boggled down with it. What did you use? Henceforth, back to the statement. Whoever suffers from depression, which is a state which now they say is a disorder, and it is a disorder, but whoever suffers from it while the Quran is mawjud, because the Quran is in reach, meaning that it gives you all of the coping mechanisms that you're going to need to not get sucked in to depression. So if you utilize that Quran, and you utilize those good thoughts, and that good positive attitude, and that optimistic, it doesn't allow you to be boggled down into depression. You see how it all connects? Here he says, negative thoughts are those that produce bad feelings. Anger. Envy. Now, anger is not just a result of bad thoughts, okay? Even though it could occur from bad thoughts, all right? Anger, that's in the pop-up video. We're not going to do that now. In, in, in the pop-up video, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to talk about anger. And we're going to go into deep and in depth about anger and how Islam um, explains anger and how we are to un understand these emotions which the Creator have given us. Inshallah Ta'ala will recover that. Um, it mentions that anger, envy, jealousy, hatred, anxiety, depression, other negative emotional states, these are thoughts about the world, our wealth, our status, people we do not like or who have wronged us, and so on. The cause of these thoughts is an attachment to the delusion. I want you to pay attention to this point right here. And this is extremely important. And this is, if you don't believe it, I can give you many verses, many ahadiths, any, many statements from Ibn Qayyim that he's going to bring, proving this point. And this is why there is a thin line between religious people, and I don't like to use the term religious, but you get what I'm saying. The, the people who are learned and live life by faith, as opposed to the people who doesn't live life by faith, but they live life by secular, more so um, their intellect and their intelligence. They approach things differently. So the concept is that the ones who live by faith, it seems like they have a negative view on mental health and these things, right? And it looks like it's a conflict because they're like, okay, just get over it, believe in the creator, 
blah, blah, blah. You shouldn't feel those emotions. It's haram, et cetera, et cetera, right? And some people have that outlook, which is wrong. That's totally wrong. That's not what Islam is saying. That's not what the Quran is saying. That's not what the Sunnah is saying. That's totally wrong to have that concept to do away altogether with these earthly emotions that we all experience to some extent. Some others, okay? Some more than others. So we can't just disregard it and sum it off to that. But you have the intelligent people who say, no, let's look at the brain, what caused the brain to move. Let's look at the psyche. Let's look at the environment. Let's look at, um, the, let's look at certain things. Let's look at what they eat in. Let's look at the biology. Let's look at all of these different things and let's study them and see where this emotion is actually coming in at. So they use that, which intelligent, and all of that is not ruled out with Islam. Using those things are important as well because they are encouraging Islam because Allah tells us to look in our bodies. To reflect upon our bodies. And we talked about that in reflections. And to deal with our bodies. So Allah tells us and encourages us to look at these different means. So we don't want to say that none of that is there. But the religious concept is what he's saying right here is actually the truth. And that's the point of the correct way if you think about it. He's saying that the causes of these thoughts is an attachment. I want you to pay attention to this point. Quote, is an attachment to the delusions of the worldly and materialistic life that clouds the heart and prevents its purification. Now, the heart is the main vessel in which the body can move. The heart is the main vessel in which spirituality can actually be practiced. The heart is so vital that it must be purified. That Tawheed in and of itself is a purifier. Okay? That it must be done to purify yourself, to have wholesome. And to be wholesome, that's what must be understood. So, your attachment in any slightest form to this earthly life, which brings about these earthly problems that is associated with this earthly world, and this earthly existence is the reason why you're going to find yourself in this state. Do you understand what it's saying? Because that's it. Depression is only tied to this world. There's no depression in heaven. There's no depression in heaven. Depression is only tied to this world, if you, if you understand this. And we mentioned the verse earlier. There's no such thing of grief, anxiety in heaven. So the earthly life itself is the only thing that has it. Your attachment now to this life is only going to be disappointment. Allah tells you not to forget your portion. Mean utilize it as a stepping tool to bring you closer to your creator and to your purpose and your to fulfilling your purpose and your role. But not to take it as it is the ultimate thing that you should actually do. You're going to become disappointed. Whoever places hopes in this world is only setting himself up for failure. This world is not everlasting. This world is already problematic. The fact that your parents were sent to this world was a form of a punishment and not what wasn't a form of, you know, a form of a good treatment. I, I, I hope you understand it. Allah Jalla Wala said, Ehmitu. Allah said, get down. He said he actually expelled them from the paradise and he sent them to earth. So earth was not looked at as it was some type of substitute of goodness. They were expelled, by the way. If you, you know, your kids get expelled from school. If you get expelled from out of a program, something like that, that was a bad thing. That's discipline. That wasn't a good thing. So us being sent here, our parents being sent here, wasn't like we was going to be here. And it's like, it's a good thing. But the creator allow us to have things within this realm and in this earth and in this life to allow us to move forward to him. And it's important that we understand this. If we do not really understand this, we're not really going to understand where's the core of depression lies. We're not going to understand what really moves us and our motivations and our, and, our, and our feelings. We're not really going to be in tune with that. No one can tell you about you more than the creator. And I, and I always stress this, and this is real important. I don't care how intellectual a person sounds. No one knows us like the creator. No one knows you like the one that made you, that understand every part of you. Which parts he used to make you. He took mixed parts from the earth to actually to produce our bodies. But yet and still he created our souls. Which he doesn't give us a full account of where he created our souls from. Do you understand this? 
So if you don't understand the ingredients of your soul, you don't understand where the mixture of your soul come from, how can you begin to speak about it? What the law say? They ask you about the ruh. They ask you, O Muhammad, about the spirit, about the soul. Say far as the ruh, you mankind have been given a little bit of knowledge. You don't know about it. So don't speak on it. You don't understand it. So don't speak on it. That spirit, that soul that we have, which that does not die, by the way. We don't know what it's made from. Allah Azawajal didn't give us that knowledge. So we have to understand that that proves to us that the maker of that soul is the knower of that soul. And he knows us in detail. So why is it that we skip past him and his remedy and his medicine and his therapy and his way of treatment and we go to substitute treatment from another human being? Who, by the way, I'm not, I'm not discouraging us not to utilize because the Prophet Wasallam prays physicians. He prays um, doctors. He prays um, doctors and things like that. We know we need them. They are a part of our lives. I'm not telling you that I'm belittling none of that, by the way. I'm telling you, as the statement is saying, quench your thirst. You have the Quran here. Use it. Allah didn't put you on this earth without giving you a way to navigate through it. That's what I'm saying. I'm not belittling with no one. All right? So we're getting ready to wrap it up. Inshallah ta'ala. But you pretty much get the gist of good attitude here. Let's continue because he, he brings some good point. I want y'all to pay attention to this statement here. So he, he says, he brings this tremendous statement, man. Wallah, he brings this tremendous statement. After what he just said about clouding your heart. So again, like I said... <clears throat> Depression, brothers and sisters, you can bring any expert and um, we can, we'd can. we love to discuss this with them from an Islamic point of view, from what Ibn Qayyim works, and many different things is that it is tied to this earth, okay? It's tied to this earth. So some type of attachment to this earth in and of itself, and you might say, brother, I hear what you're saying, but how can you live in the earth and not be affected by it? How can you live in the earth and not be attached to it? Okay, I'm going to respond with the statement of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuna he said that the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam akhtadha man kibay that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam grabbed him by his chest I mean by his shoulders and he told him he says kun fi dunya ka'annaka gharib awabi lis sabil he told many of his companions not just this young child or this young lad, as they say. But he told many of his companions, and he himself in the hadith, when he said, Mali, Mali with the dunya, he said, Mali, he said, Mali with dunya. What do I have to do with this dunya? Ma'ana fi dunya illa ki karakib. I am not in this world except as like a rider, someone who is passing through. I want you to understand this concept here. Because you might say, How can you not be attached to the dunya? How can you not have attached to the dunya? You live here, this is not your home. <laughs> this is what the Prophet is telling you. He did it both in his actions and he also he advised his companions not to get attached to it neither. He said, be in this world as if you are a stranger. <laughs> you understand? You feel out of place. This isn't your home. It wasn't the home of your parents. They were kicked out. As Ibn Uqayyim said, this is not our true home. Our true home is Jannah to Eden. As Allah said, Jannat and Eden, that garden of eating, that's our true home. That's our true abode. That's a pure place. There's no substance. There's no envy. There's no desire. And, and there's no, there's no um, anxiety. There's no depression. There's no sad. There's no grief. There's no um, anger. There's no um, jealousy. There's no rage. There's no murder. There's no killing. There's even no feces. There's no urination. None of those things exist. And that place, where our parents come from. So that's our real home. We are here temporarily. And this is not our home. We have been ordered not to attach ourselves to this dunya. We have been ordered. And whoever attaches his or herself to this dunya. Is going to suffer these things more. And they're going to find themselves in this type of pain. and this type of anxiety. The Prophet ﷺ already had the remedy. He gave you the format. It was laid down. He's laying on a date palm tree. 
He's laying on a date palm tree. Huh? They, the, the, the companions, they wanted to give him some comfort. They seen that it, that was rough. And he got up and said, man, if it dunya, what is I am the, what, this, me and the dunya, what, what connection do I have to it? I'm nothing but a rider through it. It's not my home. And he understood that. And he left that for us. So the more we can detach ourselves from the dunya, I want you to pay attention to this now. The more that we detach ourselves from the dunya, the more free our soul would be. Because our soul wasn't made for this dunya. The more free our soul would be, the more free we would not be bogged down. That means our hearts, our mind, and our thoughts. It's nothing like Islam, brothers and sisters. There's nothing like Islam. Nothing. You can go to the four corners of the earth. You're not going to find nothing like Islam. All of the answers you're looking for is in Islam. If it comes to you, Huda, from me, whoever follows it, they are not going to fear nor are they going to grieve. They're not going to have these problems. Not saying in this earth you're going to feel these problems. I don't want you to misunderstand that verse. Allah is not saying that you're not going to feel these problems. He's saying that if you do have a brush with these problems, these things are going to alleviate and not boggle you down. You're not going to dwell on them. You're going to have good thoughts because you purify yourself and make yourself clean. We're going to end it with this statement here. Bi'ibnillah. And this statement was said by Abu Sulaiman, Rahimahullah, one of the salaf of the past. He said, Al-fikru fi dunya hijabun an al akira I want to stop there before I say the whole statement. It's, this joint is deep. He said, Al-fikru fi dunya hijabun an al akira I want you to really, really, really pay attention to this. This is deep. SubhanAllah thing. He said to reflect on everything that we go through in the life of this world. To dwell is what he's saying. To dwell and to attach and to reflect on everything that we go through in the life of this world. It blocks us. It's a hijab from the hereafter. To dwell on this life as, as if it's the only life. As, as if it's the main thing. And that it's the main attraction. Then we are blocking ourselves from the hereafter. We are blocking ourselves from the hereafter. That's what we're doing. You understand? This is deep. Just dwelling on the earth, you're missing out on the hereafter. You're closing yourself off from the hereafter. Do you understand this? The verses in the Quran are aligned with this. This is what Allah says in the Quran. Allah tells you what? فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ Do not allow the life of this world to deceive you. Do not be ensnared. Do not be entrapped by its deceptions. And do not let the chief deceiver, shaitan, deceive you by Allah Azza wa Jalla. This is why Allah tells you over and over in the Quran, Oh Muhammad, do not let your eyes look beyond or get caught up and become bedazzled in those things that we have used as an adornment for the life of this world. Do you understand? How do you understand the verses in the Quran? Allah is telling you these things. They are important, brothers and sisters. They are important for us to fight depression. They are very important. Stop getting attached to a world that isn't your home. Stop being attached to the things that's here. He said, "Fikru fi dunya hijabu an al akira." It protects you from the. It, it 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 blocks you. It covers you as a hijab. It strains you from the hereafter. He doesn't stop there. Pay attention to his next statement. He says, "Wa ukubatu li ahl al walaya." وَالْفِكْرَةُ فِي الْآكِرَةِ تُورِذُ الْحِكْمَةِ وَتُحْيِي الْقَلْبِ وَمَنْ نَذْرَ إِلَى الدُّنْيَا مُوَلِّيَا صَحُ عِنْدَهُ غُرُورُهَا He says, It is a 
refrain from the hereafter, and it also is a punishment for the people who takes it as a form of protection, who takes shelter in this world, who takes shelter in this earth, who think that this earth is the best that Allah has given them. And they take shelter here, it not only blocked them from the hereafter, but it becomes a punishment for them. The very thing that they take, shelter, is a punishment. SubhanAllah. He said, and he said to dwell and to think and to look and to ponder and to perceive and to have good thoughts about the home, which is our true home, the hereafter, it produces in the individual who is like this, it produces two things. Hikmah. وَتُحْيَ الْقَلْبِ it enlivens the heart. It gives life to the heart. You won't have contentment in that heart if it's dead. You cannot experience qana'a in a dead heart. It gives life to that heart. It gives hikmah that his speech is hikmah, that his thinking is hikmah, that his actions is hikmah, that his moving about is with hikmah. This is what happens. <laughs> a person don't have to have a lot of possessions to be wise. A person don't have to be financially gained or, 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 or elevating to be wise. A person doesn't have to be someone you think of high status or a good reputation or reputable or a person who has strength and they this, this, that to be wise. No. A person can be wise by his way of thinking. I think, I think you... You, I don't know if you made that connection, but that's what he's saying. A person can become wise by the way that he thinks. If your focus is the accurate, as the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever goes to sleep and his main concern, hammuhu, is the dunya, then Allah Jalla wa Ala calls private to be in front of his face, even if you have a lot. And he only gets what's decreed for him. But whoever goes to sleep and his main concern is the akira, then Allah Jalla wa Ala gives him the dunya. I want you to pay attention to this hadith. He gives them the dunya willingly or unwillingly. Whether he wants it or not. That's how you win this bad boy. You want to win her? It's easy to win the dunya. It's easy to win the dunya. Turn your back on it. That's how you win that. And that's sort of how we win females too, right? A woman you keep showing more potential. He's a sucker. He's sweet. But then the moment you... Okay, you deflect. She, okay, why? And then she trace. It's the same thing with the dunya. All you have to do, turn your back on it. It's not the main attraction. It's not the main focus. It's going to come to you whether you want it or not. That's what this statement is saying, by the way. The way you think <laughs> has a real effect on you and uplift you. Then he said, look what he says here. He said, well, I'm another of the dunya mu'aliya. He said, whoever looks at the dunya as his protector, <laughs> will come to accept all of his delusions. <laughs> That's a person you find who is deceived by the dunya. Whoever take the dunya as their home, as their protector, their shelter, as something as it's this their abode. So Lord, as the Prophet ﷺ said, Adunya, he said, Adunya, Sijnul al Mu'min, wa Jannatu Kaf. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, the Adunya, the life of this world, is a prison for the believers. It's a prison. He went to the heavens in his dream, and he said, This is your palace that he saw in Jannah. And he was getting ready to step in. They said, No, you got more time in the dunya. The Prophet was getting ready to leave us. He's ready to step inside his palace. It was done. They said, No, you got to go back. You got some more time. I lied on your life. The dunya is a sijin only for the believer because we don't take happiness here. We don't find rest here. This is not our abode. So, all of these earthly problems that we find ourselves bogged down with, it won't touch us that much because we know this isn't the end game. 
we know that this wasn't our home in the first place. So our attachment to it was detached. And we wasn't deceived by its delusions and its illusions. It didn't take us in as it took many, many people in. This is what he said. Whoever takes the dunya as his muwaliya, as his protector, as his friend, as his helper, as his shelter, sahururuha, that person is going to accept its illusions. This is a powerful statement. And I had to end with this statement, inshallah ta'ala. Reflect on this if you can. Rewind it back. Go over this statement. It's deep. If you really think about your thought process. How do you think? Ali ibn Abi Talib, he used to visit the graves. Many of us to this day probably don't even visit a grave. Unless we go see if a loved one died. But how many of us really visit a grave? This is important. It really helps you with depression. If you think about visiting a grave, help you with depression. You say, how will it help you with depression? That's sad. How, how will it help you with depression? Because it reminds you that you never was of this world in the first place and that your life is short. And that you will be going there too. And that is important. It's a reminder. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he used to go to the grave and he used to say, Ya abana'u dunya wa ya abana'u akira. He used to say, O oh, children of the dunya and O oh, children of the hereafter. He used to say, Be children of the akira and do not be children of the dunya. Because this life and everything on it is perishable. The food you got in your pantry or the food you got in your shelves, the food you got in your refrigerator, it go bad. The bread go bad, it go spoil you, it become corrupted. Everything become perishable. Which should show you right there that there's nothing that you want to put your hopes into. So to remove yourself, you want to have good thoughts, you want to have good attitudes, stay tuned, inshallah ta'ala, for the pop-up video. We're going to do on anger as well as on good character throughout. It's going to be posted. Also, stay tuned for the next class where we're going to do um, attitude as the third coping mechanism. And we're going to go more deep into the statement of Ibn Uqayyim. We're going to read actual Ibn Uqayyim about attitude. He have a passage that we're going to read, inshallah ta'ala, and we're going to respond, respond on that and reflect on it. Hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, this uplifted everyone's spirit. Um, it gave us a, a good outlook onto Islam, and let's stick to that, inshallah ta'ala. Whoever said that was incorrect from myself and the shaitan, whoever says correct from Allah, jalla wa'ala. Subhanakallah, wa bihamdi. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa an. Astaghfiru wa atubu ilayk. Jazakallah khair. May Allah reward you all.